Um, I'd like to introduce Victoria Law, who is a writer, a photographer, and a mother. After a brief stint as a teenage arm robber, she became involved in prisoner support. In 1996, she helped start Books Through Bars New York City, a group that sends free books to prisoners nationwide. In 2000, she began concentrating on the needs and actions of women in prison, drawing attention to their issues by writing articles and giving public presentations. She covered the California prison hunger strikes for the nation and truth out. Her work has also appeared on Bitch Media, New Clear Vision, and Left Turn. She's also the new political editor of Hip Mama magazine, and she's the author of two books, Resistance Behind Bars, The Struggles of Incarcerated Women, and Don't Leave Your Friends Behind, Concrete Ways to Support Families in Social Justice mo Movements and Communities. Welcome, Vicki. difficult to go after both Bonnie and Teresa, given such rousing speeches, so I will try. Um, so first I wanted to start with a couple of questions. Just by a show of hands, how many of you have followed the recent California prison hunger strikes? Um, so for those of you who didn't or you know might need a refresher, um, on July 8th of this year, over 30,000 people incarcerated in California re began refusing meals, and it was the largest prison hunger strike in the history of the state of California, perhaps in the history of the entire United States. They were united around demands, demand, um, demanding an end to indefinite solitary confinement, conditions inside the solitary confinement cells, and the way that bogus gang charges were used to place people in solitary confinement indefinitely. The hunger strike lasted 60 days, um, and there were many solidarity fasts and strikes going on both outside and inside prisons. How many of you have heard, heard of the California hunger strikes that took place in 2011 that Teresa mentioned? All right, so in 2011, people in California went on hunger strikes, again, about these same conditions. So basically, this started in 2011, you know, when their demands were not met again this past year. How many of you know that women in California prisons were on solidarity hunger strike in 2011? Okay. Um, and how many of you thought about women at all when you heard about the hunger strikes this year or in 2011? Okay, so I want to give a little bit of background on women in solitary confinement in California just to kind of give you a specific state and a specific place to anchor yourself in. So as some of you may remember, in May of 2011, the U.S. Supreme Court actually ruled that California's prison overcrowding had such dire effects on the well-being and health care of the people inside that it actually violated the Eighth Amendment and constituted cruel and unusual punishment. And it issued an order to the state of California that they had to reduce their prison population to 133% capacity. Not even like you just have to be at 100% capacity, you can only be at 133% capacity. And the state of California has been fighting this ever since. So they've tried a myriad of different ways to re technically reduce their state prison population without actually releasing people from the prison system or finding alternatives to incarceration. One of the ways they've done so is that they've converted the Valley State Prison for Women, which is one of the three prisons for women in the state of California, into a men's prison. They said that the women who were in Valley State Prison would be eligible for alternative custody, meaning that they wouldn't actually have to be in the prison system, and therefore that's why they could convert this prison to a men's prison to deal with the overcrowding. But instead, they just moved a thousand or so women into the remaining two prisons, which were already overcrowded. So in July of 2000, as of July 2013, the neighboring Central California Women's Facility, the, one of the other two women's prisons, was at 175% capacity, housing approximately 1,500 more people than it was actually designed for. So you have women who are living four to six to a cell, you know, for, in a cell that's designed to maybe hold two to four women. You have people not being able to access programs. And you have to remember, too, that when we're talking about the women's prison population, oftentimes we're talking not just in California, but across the nation, about people who have been incarcerated for drug crimes 
or for property offenses. So we're looking at a traumatized population that might be better off, both for themselves and for their families and communities, perhaps going to drug treatment on the outside or some sort of other programs and not necessarily being locked away from their families and communities for years and years and years. And, to drill, um, and then with the conversion of Valley State Prison to a men's prison, the women in these two other California prisons were placed in the two solitary confinement units. There's the SHU or the security housing unit, which is a form of indefinite solitary confinement. And then there's administrative segregation, which means if you've broken a prison rule, you know, you get placed in what's called ad seg for a certain period of time as punishment. And in the women's prisons in California, women are being placed there not because they've broken rules, not because they're being accused of gang affiliations, but because there's no room for their, them anywhere else in the prison. So they're basically locked into these solitary confinement units, unable to access any programs, or be able to call home, or any of the things that you might be able to do in general population, again, because the state of California has a huge prison overcrowding problem. So in one of the prisons, as of July 2013, at the Calif Central California Women's Facility, there are 129 women in the ad seg unit, and the average length of stay there is 133 days. And again, keep in mind that for many of them, it's not because they've broken any rules or violated anything, but simply because the prison has no space for them in the general population or in the dormitories. In the other women's prison that still exists, the California Institute for Women, as of July 2013, there were 32 women in the ADSEG unit and 99 in the security housing unit. The security housing unit has a capacity of 60. So that means that over half of those women are locked up with a cellmate. Now, if you look at um, Audrey's collages, you can see, like, you know, sort of what a solitary confinement looks like. So imagine being stuck in a little 8 by 10 cell. Imagine your closet, you know, with a cellmate. And imagine being locked into a cell for 22 to 23 and a half hours a day with someone else that you may not like, that you may not get along with, or that person might be fine, but maybe they snore, maybe they wheeze. Maybe you just want to get away from them and you can't because you're just looking at them. So that is what looking at solitary confinement in a California women's prison looks like. In California's security housing unit, both in the men's prisons and the women's prisons, you're not allowed to make phone calls. This is really hard for anyone. And keep in mind that when you're in solitary confinement in California, visits are no contact visits. So I imagine not being able to hug your dad, not being able to do anything with your mom, you know, because there's a glass separating you, and then not being able to get phone calls. In the solitary confinement cells, both in California and in other states, women have no privacy. The toilets are in full view of the cell door windows, and male guards can watch them while they're on the toilet, while they're undressing, while they're in the showers, as part of their job. Um, in the showers, if women complain about male guards watching them, the guards have the power to just turn the water off and your shower is done. Now that I've thrown some of these really horrifying, what's going on here? All of these really horrifying um, stories and facts at you, let's talk a little bit about what resistance, what resistance has looked like. So during the 2011 hunger strike, women in California's prison system went on hunger strike both in solidarity with the men who were on hunger strike about inter indeterminate solitary confinement and to protest their own conditions. So they were saying like, we are in solidarity with our brothers, nobody should be placed in indefinite solitary confinement. And then also, we're staging this hunger strike because the conditions inside our prison need to change. You know, we need to like not be in these security housing units. We need not to be subjected to male guards watching us or not being able to call our children or to, talk, um, to touch our children if they can make the long drive to come and see us. This past year, women or people in the Central California Women's Facility held weekly solidarity fasts and prayer walks. So every Friday, women in the prison refused food in solidarity with the men who were on hunger strike. And they also issued a statement which said, we walk and pray at the same time for the men who are suffering from unfair treatment. They are already paying for the crimes they committed. The SHU, or security housing unit, is cruel and unusual punishment, and us humans are entitled to have contact with other humans. The law says people can't be in solitary confinement for too long. The law is breaking its own law. We 
at the prison got together and put out flyers for all the people here to stand up and join the people in the SHU and help reach their demands. This issue affects all of us. Now going back a little bit into time, you know, we see that women have protested their um, conditions of solitary confinement and their placement in solitary confinement, and we're not necessarily remembering these instances. So going back to the 1970s, how many of you have heard of the 1974 August Rebellion? Okay, so in 1974, at Bedford Hills, which is a maximum security prison for women in New York State, there was a black woman named Carol Crooks who filed a lawsuit against Bedford Hills because she was saying that the prison administration was placing women in solitary confinement without any notice of their charges and without giving them a chance to defend themselves against the charges. Why? In 1974, a court ordered, she actually won a court injunction that prohibited the prison from placing women in solitary confinement without 24-hour notice and a hearing of these charges. So basically the court sided with her and said, even though you are in prison, you have the right to due process before you are placed in solitary confinement. In retaliation for this, guards, several guards, beat her up and then dragged her off to the solitary confinement unit without any sort of hearing or charges or anything. So obviously they were retaliating against her. And that might have just been another case of staff brutality against someone in prison who won a legal victory, except the women in the unit around her said, you know what, enough is enough is enough. And they rioted. And they rioted for several hours. And they took over portions of the prison and they took seven staff members hostage. And it wasn't until the state sent in state troopers and guards from the neighboring men's prison that they were able to take back the prison. And during the course of this, 25 women were sent to solitary confinement, again, without any of the required hearings that the court had said they had to have. And 24 women were transferred to the Mentea One complex for the criminally insane, again, without any sort of hearings. But this riot also galvanized people in the women's and lesbian communities to start looking at what was going on inside women's prisons. They were saying, you know what, wait a minute, we've been doing work around all these different issues. <coughs> we're also gonna start, we've been doing work around prison issues. We've totally forgotten about our sisters inside. And that's what we need to be looking at and supporting. And they began organizing and activating and they actually got the 24 women transferred back to Bedford Hills from the Mateo One complex for the in criminally insane and also began forming relationships with women inside so they were reporting about their conditions of confinement, giving them forums to speak out about this and connecting them to the larger struggles that were happening outside. So again, women have fought against solitary confinement, we're just not necessarily seeing it. Kind of coming back to the present, Bonnie talked about the sexual violence that women face when they're in solitary confinement. But how many of you know that in women's prisons, women can get placed in solitary confinement for reporting being sexually assaulted by staff members? So in prison after prison after prison, women are afraid to come out to say anything because it means being placed in segregation um, because they've reported sexual assault or even sexual abuse, like this guard was peeping at me, you know, what's going on with that by staff members. At the women's prison in Denver, Colorado, in response to the passing of the 2003 Prison Rape Elimination Act, the prison administration created a new rule called false reporting to authorities, which states, an offender commits this offense when she, A, makes a report alleging criminal conduct by a DOC employee or any other person knowing that the allegation is false, untruthful, or misleading, and um, women have reported being placed in solitary confinement for even talking about sexual abuse by staff. So not even complaining or officially reporting, but some woman will say to another woman in the hearing of a guard, hey, you know, I hear guard X, you know, like really, you know, needs, like, you know, like he's too touchy or he said inappropriate things and staff members will say, well, that's false reporting. Hmm. You know, we'll place you in solitary confinement. In addition, women who are caught having sex with staff members are placed in solitary confinement as well. And this is not limited to Colorado. Like Colorado has an actual rule in the books, but the practice has gone, you know, has been practiced in prisons across the nation. Former staff at Ohio's women's prisons also reported that women who talked about sexual abuse were subjected to lengthy periods of time in solitary confinement, where cells often had feces and blood smeared on the wall. And there have also been reports in Michigan and in other states. And we would perhaps know more about how widespread this practice is if it wasn't for the threat of solitary confinement for anybody who speaks out. So a woman in Texas reported, 
When officers are found to be involved, the common course of action is to move her to another facility. If she consented in any way, she will be placed in ADSEG. Being moved with a jacket of a prior officer relationship can make time very difficult. And if they found any reason to write the inmate a major case, it also costs her at least a one-year parole set-off. Being moved, time in isolation, a label, and a set-off, those are powerful motivations to keep a girl quiet. And then finally, another twist that prison administrations have also been done to both penalize sexual contact and place people in solitary confinement is that in women's prisons, people who are caught in any sort of consensual relationship with each other are also sent to segregation, and sometimes with the threat of being written up for sexual misconduct and or sexual abuse on each other. So women who try to form loving relationships with each other are also at threat of being placed in solitary. And then um, when we're talking about prisons, we also have to remember that not everybody in a particular prison, a men's prison or a women's prison, necessarily identifies as a man or a woman. So they might be classified as that based on what their birth certificate says. But there are an unknown number of trans women in men's prisons and trans men in women's prisons. And trans people are often placed in protective custody to ostensibly protect them from violence from other prisoners. But protective custody means that they are placed in solitary confinement, where there are no cameras, no ability to participate in programs, um, and it increases the opportunities for staff members to harass and or abuse them. So one trans woman reported, protective custody is even worse because there are no cameras. And another one said that um, officers repeatedly shut off her cell's water and power, issued her false tickets for rules violations, and instigated <coughs> other prisoners to assault her. So again, keep in mind that even things that are seen as like nice, like protective custody, we have to ask ourselves further, well, what is this actually doing? You know, like, and what does this actually mean for the people inside? Thank you.